We're up to our entire interview with, well, a lady who grew up Bacaro, Heather Bacaro, Steve Bacaro's daughter. Steve, of course, was in the band for such a long time, left right after the seventh one, or actually sort of before the seventh one, but was featured on the album. Came back many moons later, and now he's on his own again doing his own solo stuff. But Heather is a real gem, as you'll see in this interview. What a delightful young lady, so talented. Heartstring Symphony is her latest album. You can check it out on Spotify and all the streaming outlets. We'll have links to her website as well. As I said, we lost about 30 interviews a couple of years ago because a hard drive just stopped working. And after a couple of years, we just thought, let's try it again. Let's plug it in. We plugged it in and it worked and we got Heather back and a whole bunch of other interviews which we're going to feature to you now. Heather Bracaro on Rock History Book. It was just life to me. I said, well, didn't you didn't right. you know it was different? She said, well, it was just my dad. So what about you? Yeah. I mean, growing up in L.A., I feel like I feel like probably most people who did grow up in Los Angeles um, have kind of similar stories. I feel like a lot of people have similar stories with like going to school with someone, you know, someone's kid or, you know, I. And I, I did go to private school. I think, you know, pr I did go to private school for a while. And um, yeah, there was like, I went to school with Barry White's daughter and I got to go to Barry White's house after school. <laughs> and so, and as a, as a, um, you know, preteen, it's not really clicking or I'm not really understanding the weight of the well, fact that I'm in Barry White's <laughs> wait a minute. When Barry White was like, you know, stirring the sauce, did he make it sound really romantic? <laughs> you would have taken that sauce. Yes, it was. It's probably one of my like looking back. It's like wow, I can't. I'm like I still pinch myself, and I remember their house like the back of my hand. Like it was, every room had a different color theme. It was just like, it was so magical. It was so magical and it was just, but I didn't, you know, I'm like kid. And so you don't really, you don't totally understand yeah. exactly what is happening and like what that means as far as like the world of music or, you know, pop culture or, you know, any of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's Los Angeles is a really funny place to grow up in. For love. Let's start there yeah. with track number one. Okay. For instance, I have this theme. I'm very psychology based kind of guy. Yeah. For love. I'm thinking, okay, is she looking, okay, what's the right time for love? I, I used to host a show up until the beginning of the year and it was on for 25 years called love songs. And the type of calls as you can imagine that I got were fooey, pookie foo, crazy. Like every, if anything brings out the worst and the best of us, it's love. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. It's a vulnerable state to be in. And a lot of the time I would get calls from people who would say things like, well, you know, I just broke up with my husband, but I turned around at the pizza joint in the broccoli department of the, or whatever. And I met this perfect guy and he, right. he never felt this way. So is it about, what's that song about, about like. It's about, it's about meeting somebody that you have a connection with or that you think you have an, a connection with. <laughs> But it's just it's just not the right time for whatever reason, whether you live in different states or they're already in a relationship or you are. It's a song about um, just it not being the right time and place uh, in the middle. Wh I, I, what's that about? Uh, John Wicks is playing drums. He plays drums on the whole record. And John Wicks is like basically family to me. He's an incredible drummer. He's in Fits in the Tantrums. And he lives in Missoula, Montana, and he has this amazing uh, coffee shop called Drum Coffee, which I highly, highly, highly recommend everybody going to drumcoffee.com and checking it out. They literally make uh, roast beans and give them drummer names. It's like the coolest. Wait a I can order. So cool. I can order coffee beans from them. You can order Porcaro Joe Poe coffee beans. <laughs> From, from John Wicks. In the Middle is about just all of the insanity of life, you know, going through just, I mean, life is hard. Let's just be honest. <laughs> life is very difficult. And, um, 
And just that it's like, it's kind of about a codependent relationship. It's about that feeling of just being absolutely lost without this person and needing to find, needing to find stability. And, um, you know, whether it's with yourself or in a relationship, um, just kind of that stability. And, and it's, I definitely, that song, I definitely wrote during a period where I was feeling, I was coming out of a more kind of codependent way of having relationships and feeling like I was going into a more healthier, healthier zone <laughs> in my choices. Um, so that, that song is just, it's all of my songs are really personal about like literally how I'm feeling and, and kind of going through the wackiness that I feel inside of my head. And the thing I love about songwriting is it's a more, it's a kind of a more like avant-garde way of expressing your feelings without needing to be like too literal. You can be a little bit, you can like express how you're feeling and what you're going through and what you're processing without being like so on the nose, but you still feel like you've, you've gotten it out of your system. Oh, who let the strangers in? I like that. Question. Yeah. I want to know is out right now. Um, yeah. That's the single that we've released for the record. And I wrote, I actually wrote that song a while ago. Like a lot of these songs for this record, I actually wrote, this was like a batch I wrote a little while ago and we've remixed and remastered this record. And so now it's being released digitally um, on all formats. And so that song I actually wrote a while ago, strangely enough, during the Bush era. <laughs> and um, it's very, I felt like a, a lot of what I was saying actually was mirroring how I was feeling during the Trump era. <laughs> and so I was like, well, this is really fitting, like timely to like kind of re-release this song and breathe new life into it. Cause I really feel the same way. Um, and yeah, it's just about, you know, it's about society and politics and the craziness that <laughs> we're surrounded by. And it doesn't matter like what side you're on, you know what I mean? Like it's, the same feelings, you know what I mean? And that, I think about that a lot where it's like how crazy, you know, say I may think someone else's thoughts and feelings are about a subject matter. They're thinking the same way about me, <laughs> they're having like the same reaction about me, which when I think about that, it kind of blows my mind where I'm like, how is this possible? How on earth is this even possible? Like they are feeling the same way about me as I'm feeling about them. And we both are just like, it's like two totally different planets, like, <laughs> like we're operating in. And so, yeah, I want to know is, is me just trying to make sense of, of all of it in my head <laughs> the best I can um, and put it to music. <laughs> oh, just a ghost. Oh, you're looking for nothing and I'm looking for something. I, I like that. Is that about opposites? What's that song about? Yeah, it's the same. It's um, the same musicians are on the whole record. So Tony Berg produced it and he played a lot of guitar on it. My husband, Alec, um, played a lot of guitars on the record. Also, John Wicks is on drums. Dylan Cooper played bass on all the tracks and um, an incredible engineer, Sean Everett, um, engineered the whole record. He's he's amazing. And um, my dad did play on the record as well. He played a lot of a lot of synths and keys on the on the record. By the way, you mentioned your husband. I'm good. I ask a lot of people this. Some people, old rock stars, says, "I'm not going to tell you that." How'd you meet your husband? Is his name is Alec? Alec with a C. Yeah. Okay. How'd you meet him? So originally, um, we met through my cousin Chase. I have a cousin Chase. Um, we met through my cousin Chase years ago. No smart then then or not. What was there a spark then or not? No, there wasn't a spark. We, we just met in passing. And then I, I had a boyfriend at the time. So I wasn't even thinking about that. And then like a decade later, um, it's kind of funny. I was living in this bungalow in Echo Park and there were like six of them. And this, this guy moved into one of them. We became friends. He was a drummer and he kept asking us to me and this other friend of ours who lived in the bungalows, like, Hey, come see my band play. And we finally went and saw the band play. And then I was like, re met Alec and his brothers and stuff. And so it was just, it was just so weird because it was like, Did you I remember him? him? Did you remember? We, him? Yeah, we totally remembered each other. So, so it was, you were saying it's so weird. It was so weird. What? 
oh, it was just weird to like meet someone and then a decade later re-meet them through a totally different circle and circumstance completely. So I was kind of like, okay, this is weirdly meant to be. And so we started hanging out a lot just as friends and because of music and we, he joined my band and started playing with me. And, um, and then it just like slowly evolved into, into a romance. And then that evolved into actually getting married. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay. Don't take too long. It's one of my favorite songs. I like the energy of that tune. Oh yeah. That's one. Of, that's actually one of my favorite songs on the album too. Why young that's lady? That. Tell me about that song. <laughs> um, I, I just have, I mean, I love, I'm a sucker for like, uh, Ennio Morricone, like spaghetti Western kind of dark Western-y. Um, I also love rockabilly music, which I'm like, I don't know. Like I just, there's like, there's in that song, it's, there's like kind of like a combination of a lot of things, a lot of genres that I like kind of all wrapped up into one. And, um, and it's more of a heavy, a heavier rock song on the record. I feel like it's a little bit darker in vibe. Um, yeah, it's just kind of about staying on your course and, um, you know, staying, keep going. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like, especially as I think, I mean, it's like for anybody really, but like, I think for artists, it's really hard to like stay focused and like to keep going, (laughs) to keep going, even when, things and all of the elements are coming again, which feels like some things are coming against you to, you know, persuade you to keep moving forward. Space Monkey. I, I, I had a friend in high school wrote a song called Space Monkey. It's not really? a story, but it was about Albert, all the Alberts that died in the, uh, in, in, you know, when they were testing monkeys in space. Yeah, in space. Albert yeah. too and Albert, you know, but anyway, yeah. what, what's your Space Monkey about? Well, it kind of what like kind of like some of the concept was based on that. Um, and I, I kind of was imagining, it was like this fantasy imagining of me being in space with one of these monkeys. <laughs> really? Are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, completely. And, um, yeah, space monkey is about me. <laughs> it's about how far out I feel in my head at times and just trying to make sense, trying to make sense of it all. I mean, I have definitely, um, you know, struggled with anxiety pretty much my whole life, (laughs) my entire life, um, in all sorts of facets, you too. (laughs) And so Space Monkey is definitely, it's kind of, it's about that. It's about me kind of working through um, anxiety, depression, having the Space Monkey partner with me, um, feeling like I'm in orbit, you know, so often and and um, so that's that's what Space Monkey is about in a in a nutshell. Seasons. Cool. What's that song about? I'll, we'll come back to it. Oh yeah, Seasons. Um, I'd have to say Seasons is um my favorite song on this record. Um, it's about. I actually wrote it about Hurricane Katrina. After Hurricane Katrina happened, I the images of people sitting on top of their homes and waiting for to be rescued and. And the lack of response um, from our government was just so heartbreaking to me. And it was unbelievable. There's, there's, it was really unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I like will never get some of the images out of my head. Um, and that song is just about the resiliency of the human spirit and um, going through something that horrific or that hard and surviving it and rebuilding. And so that's what... That's what Seasons is about. Is it all about? Uh, how did that come about? Um, I actually, I, uh, my husband Alec and I, we we produce also um, on the side. Besides working on our own stuff, we like have written and developed and worked on with other artists. And we had just finished working with an artist, um, Leah Do. She's a Chinese artist. In, it, she's what she's she's amazing she's one of my favorite artists actually and we were lucky enough to be a part of developing her and writing with her and producing her first record and then um I made a video for her kind of by accident um Universal wanted her to have a, a music video kind of just something more of like a EPK kind of video and 
I just like shot this video for her that then became a music video just by kind of by accident became something that I didn't realize it was becoming. Um, and then Luke and David saw it, saw this music video I made for this other artist. And they were just like, wait, what's going on? Like, you can do that. <laughs> and I was like, I guess I can do that. Cause, cause it kind of was happening by accident. And they're like, can we hire you to, to work on some of our stuff with us? And I was like, of course. And so it just became this, it became so magical because I got to go to Japan with them on this Japanese tour and, you know, photograph them and film them and document it. And it was, um, it was just like, it was so sentimental. And then I ended up getting a couple of my friends, Nick and Jennifer, Nick Taylor and Jennifer Brandt have a company called Thunderwing Press. And they do branding and typography and for, for books and businesses and all sorts of things and, and albums. And they're, I just think these, these people are like geniuses with what they do. So I had them come on board to help kind of create the new album cover and the new, and the logo and the layout and the whole package. Um, so it was definitely, it felt like, it felt like a family project. Cause I was like bringing in friends of mine who were like family and, it was, it was really, really fun. It was really fun and funny to just be like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm photographing, <laughs> like taking pictures of all you guys. It was just so like- that was you, that was all you. Sure. Yeah, all their photos. I took all their photos. And I definitely, yeah, I'm, I mean, like I don't have any training whatsoever as far as being a photographer um, or a filmmaker. I just, I'm such a fan of all of it. And I've, in my own way, have studied it. And so um, I just kind of went for it. Oh, Joni Mitchell Blue. Oh, my God. 50 years old. Amazing. Joni Mitchell Blue turns 50 this year. Okay. Do you, is that one of your favorites? You like blue? Everyone loves Blue. Yeah. Who doesn't? I mean, that's just like, that was, those are one of those records, especially when you're a songwriter, that's just like pivotal in, in like going deep into your like cell membranes <laughs> and like, like locking on and like, being a part of everything, the fiber of your being. <laughs> it rewires you. I think Blue is one of those albums that made me cry. And I don't like, I'm a big tough lumberjack guy. And when I was young, it made me cry. Yeah. It's next level. Yeah. Well, see, that was good. Good quote. Uh, most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you on stage. Okay. Most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me on stage. Well, technically, okay. My first Holy Communion, I was on stage. <laughs> And I fainted and Father Larkin had to pick me up and take me back to where the, um, <laughs> to where the priests live. I remember going into the kitchen and like them giving me orange juice and a snack um, to, to recover. And then I had to go home and rest. And then like a couple days later, my family had to come back to the church with me to do my own private first Holy communion. Cause I passed out at the, the group one. <laughs> My biggest influence. In anything. In anything. Well, can I say two things? Yeah. I'd say, um, well, I'd say my friends and family, my community, and nature. Yeah. Those are my two biggest influences. Uh, first album you ever bought? Oh, um, Anita Baker. Um, oh, uh, it was a cassette. The Rapture? Rapture. I was in Minneapolis and my cousin took me to a record store. And I remember um, like my mom gave me some cash so I could buy something. And I was, I don't remember how old I was, whatever, however, what, I don't know the math of when that record came out, but I remember going into the store and seeing the cover <laughs> and being like, that looks like something I want to listen to. <laughs> and I remember my cousin who was like five years older than me, I must have been like eight or something. And my cousin was, and my, he was like, huh? Like, he was just like, that looks like something like an older person would want to buy. And I was like, I think this is going to be good. <laughs> oh, what's the nicest car you ever had? The nicest car I ever had um, was actually the first car I ever had, which was a, just a used Volvo. Best cars in the world. Yeah. Best. I had an XC. My company car was a, was a the big SUV. The XC90 had two of them. Loved oh, them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were a little girl, what did you want to do? What did you want to be when you grow up? When you were a little girl? 
Um, funny you should ask. I recently found my autobiography that I wrote when I was like 10 years old. <laughs> and in it, it was like a school project. And in it, it said I wanted to be a choreographer and a piano player. So I'm kind of kind of doing that. <laughs> so no kidding. Uh, you ever experience a religious experience or a spiritual experience? All the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all you have to say. Yeah, all the That's time. All, all, yeah, me too. Hope you enjoyed that. Heather Picaro is just such a sweetheart, huh? An interview we thought we lost, and all of a sudden that hard drive started working again. And we were able to save 30 interviews we really thought we lost forever. She's charming, she's talented, and she can do a lot of different things, as you heard in the interview. We'll have links to Heather Picaro in the description if you want to support the channel. There, all the links are there. We're on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. You'll get all our long videos, all our short videos if you join all these groups. You'll get a lot of personal stuff from Shannon and I and our family as well. Make a donation, buy a t-shirt, join our Patreon. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. Take care.